So it's six o'clock on Wednesday, August 16th, and I'm going to call the um, Maple Run Unified School District Board of Directors meeting to order. Um, and the first thing we need to go over is the agenda review. Um, are there any agenda revisions requested? No. So the agenda is accepted without objection. Next thing is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And do we have any visitors? Okay, so if um if someone comes up in the next couple minutes, we can let them in. All right, so I did want to welcome um, Stephanie. This is your first official, official yeah. meeting. <laughs> and Re Rebecca. There you are. And then also um, Carly and Jess Frost, who's not here tonight. But she will be next time. So the next uh, item is our con consent agenda. Um, any revisions requested? So we'll accept we'll accept those without objection, and that includes the approval of the meeting minutes and the media package. So the next item is reports to the board. We had thought we'd have the principals kind of get, give an update of how things are getting ready for the school year to start. Who wants to go first? Don't all jump at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't mind. Okay, Angela. No, no. So we're really excited about uh, the new school year, and it's interesting because um, having been here through COVID, um, I actually feel like there's there's just a lot of hope going into this year, a lot of a lot of freshness. Um, so that's that's exciting more than you know, I could have said the last few years. Um, so for our students, we had some really wonderful uh, summer programming. We had between 225 and 250 students each week uh, for camp, um, and that was for four weeks at a variety of camps. We had the 5-8 uh, down at the bay for a bay camp. Um, we had um, sports and adventure camp. We had an art, a music, a cooking camp, and we also had a, a kindergarten so all uh, very successful, very appreciative to the staff for their hard work in organizing and, and putting that together. But for our students for the school year, uh, and you'll probably hear this from others, really focusing on that social emotional component, really providing a safe, uh, welcoming, secure learning environment for our students. And that involves you know, increasing student attendance, uh, their engagement, their participation, which in turn, our goals are around you know, improving our math and literacy skills for the kids. Uh, and you'll hear more about that today. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our staff, um, this year, we've had the most changes in SATEC staff um, since I've been at SATEC, and this is starting the 18th year. So we've had, um, this year we'll have 11 new staff, uh, nine are new teachers, uh, that includes two of our building subs, so those folks are all new. And then we have nine staff who've changed positions within the school, which is pretty interesting. But I think in education right now, um, you know, it's been very stressful. There's been burnout. And I'm really excited about it because I think there's people that are able to stay in education, what they love, but try something and then work on something different. So that, that's really nice. <clears throat> and with the changes, you know, in service and start of the year, we will really be working on um, the team building um, through a restorative practice focus and just getting people uh, connected. Another thing, um, obviously, in supporting our students, we're going to be working on all the social emotional and literacy and math work, and that will be some of our Wednesday time as well. We also, with the help of Starling Collaborative and, and feedback we've received from our staff, uh, we will be uh, redesigning and, and restructuring our leadership team. We really heard um, for you know, more voice, more uh, shared leadership, and so we're redesigning and, and getting a listening member. So I think that'll really, um, really help. 
I think, I think a lot during COVID, a lot of things were told to you. And I think there's a real feeling of, of wanting to have some of that, um, that input. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, along with some of the changes for, uh, for parents, you know, we certainly are encouraging volunteers, um, you know, signing up with teachers coming in. You know, a couple of years back, you know, we couldn't really do a lot of that, so we're really encouraging that. And we have a variety of different open house back to school nights, either in August or September. Um, and that's, um, that can all be found. We have a parent newsletter, a welcome back newsletter that will be uh, sent out um, via Blackboard tomorrow, and then we're also going to send hard copies out. So you'll see all the dates in there. So just w times and ways for parents to come in. And, and then another piece of state tech that's exciting that we did last year were the community nights. Uh, last year we focused around the literacy. So we will be, we don't have dates for those yet, but we plan to do some more of those. Um, and with the leadership team, they might have a a different twist to them. So just different ways to engage in, in our, our community involved. Uh, the last piece is um, our building. You know, we take pride in our building and, and how uh, it looks and, and the comfort level for kids. We um, started a noise reduction plan well before COVID and we had one grade level. We, we didn't get to it. It was supposed to be done in, in the summer of 2020 and we, we couldn't do it. So we finally did that this summer and that involved putting walls and doors and that was in C South, so that'll be our um, incoming fifth graders will be in there. So the teachers are super excited, it looks great and we put new flooring in. We also have new flooring in fourth grade and eighth grade. It's gonna make the, those spaces really nice. Um, and you know, we did the normal upgrades of sprinkler system pipes and you know, things like that just to keep the, the maintenance in the building. So I, I think overall, I'm just really excited about this year, kind of a fresh start and just the excitement. A lot of the new staff that we that we talked with this week, they're, they're really excited about starting. And I think there's just a little bit of a different energy, a, lo a little bit um, more excitement about of what we can do and some of the organizational things that we've done as a district. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I have a couple of questions. So the, the summer camps, are they open to all the district or say tech is prioritized? <clears throat> well, each of the schools runs their, um, um, their own. And so they usually, we usually have students of our own because we have relationships yeah. and we know them. I don't know that there was ever a request for going to different ones, but we've kind of just kept our own students for them. Okay. And then I should know this question, but I don't. Where's the funding come from for that? That's from Esser. Okay. Yeah, that's been a huge, huge thing for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll go. <laughs> um, so Fairfield, we had our summer program, even though we did have a huge construction project within our building. So we used the middle school classrooms, and we um, had 62 students attend. And what was nice is that we also collaborated with the Black Creek Adventure Camp. So students could go to our summer program in the morning, and then we would transport them to Black Creek and East Fairfield, which is great. So it gave them lots of activities throughout the day. Um, they did activities, gardening, painting, performing plays, multiple art projects, and they um, went and visited a farm. So goals for the year, so again, along with the Maple Run goals of social emotional <coughs> learning, academics, and engagement, um, Fairfield's going to focus on project-based learning as well. So we were really fortunate last year that the district sent seven teachers and myself to California. Um, and so we attended the national conference for project-based learning. And that's really going to give, um, give the staff a different, ask, different look and instructional practices for science and social studies. Um, and our goal this year is to really revamp our annual project sweet talk. So we're going to start out with that. That's something that everyone is familiar with. And then my hope for next year is that more teachers, once they've engaged in that process and planning, that they'll take the opportunity um, to take the professional development during the in-service time that's offered here for our district. So I'm very excited about that. Um, for staff, I'm really fortunate that I have 45 returning staff coming to Fairfield, back to Fairfield. And I'm welcoming one new classroom teacher and one new special educator. I have two staff that changed positions within Fairfield. For in-service, so again, like um, Angela said, we're going to focus a lot on team building, and a lot of that is to create connections within the staff. 
we really want to have um, create and foster a supportive work environment for each other so it's a really um, huge component of having a safe environment also for the children so teachers will be expected to collaborate with grade level teams to further develop the academic and the social emotional goals um, work will also focus on goal setting reflection panorama training and discussion around the special education law and one of the things that the leadership team worked on this summer is called the graduate profile and so we really wanted to talk about the skills necessary that a child needs when they leave Fairfield to go on to high school. So we took the skills of the, um, the transferable skills and then we also took some characteristics such as resilience, empathy, and kindness. And so with that vision, it's allowing us to look at the programming that Fairfield's offering and making sure that we're meeting that goal. For parents, uh, we love it when they come in. It's a nice small school, so it's really great. Everyone pretty much knows one another, which is nice. Um, we will have our annual open house on the 21st, and this year we'll have our second annual harvest night where we have a dinner and have crafts and games for families. It's a really big hit last year. We had about 220 people come, so it was really exciting. Building improvements. Um, Fairfield's looking really good. I'm not going to lie. It looks great. So we had, um, we had all of our ceiling tiles and uh, torn down and replaced with new um, lighting. We had our HVAC system had some maintenance done. Um, all of the, LED, all the LEDs were replaced with dimmers. The 2020 wing, um, our heat was updated. We have new furniture in the library. Um, so it's really fostering a more um, inviting environment for the students and also promoting um, habits of a healthy reader, which we're excited about. Um, the conference room got new floor and furniture. Some classrooms got some new flooring. Um, we got some security cameras within the school. Um, we have we got some new concrete pads poured in the front of the school for safety and in the rear of the school. Um, and then typical maintenance took place of cloth painting classrooms and the floors waxed. Um, and just to end, what I'm excited about is I'm really excited to be returning for my second year at Fairfield. We as a staff will continue our amazing work that we started last year with our NTSS system and the literacy curriculum. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the students on the first day. The school's been pretty quiet, so I'm really excited to see the kids, the growth that they make and the growth that the staff make. So. Thank you. I'll go a short one in the back. Um, <laughs> So I'm really excited uh, to start the new year. Um, and so talking about summer programs, we too had summer programs. We had over 90 kids um, in our summer, summer program, 32 of which um, were in credit recovery and regained some credits that they might not have gained if uh, the year had ended. Um, we, but that leaves us like 58 kids um, did enrichment activities and we had outdoor and art um, clubs and camps we had a SAT prep and college essay writing um, uh, course, well not course really, but um, a summer uh, activity. And I was actually surprised how many signed up for that. That was impressive. Um, and then we had a justice and poetry event um, in Burlington that a bunch of kids signed up for. Um, so lots of kids doing that. Staffing, we have 11 new staff members, which last year we had 19. Um, and so 11 seems pretty um, uh, uh, good, considering we didn't have that much turnover. Um, one of which is from the district and is entering our, our system, but um, the rest are new. Um, professional learning, um, the, I had the luxury of being in the building at the end of the year, um, so I was able to kind of lay the groundwork of kind of where we were going last year. Um, so where we were headed, um, which I've talked about before, is um, the behavior support system at BFA is going through some changes. And so all of our staff um, were, were sort of practices trained, in, or I should say the majority of our staff was trained in June to kind of get us ready to, to start working on that. And then the goal for this year, too, is to do UDL and SEL and where they intersect, which is continuing that learning from last year. Basically, both of those components are going to help us with our kind of vision of high expectations with high supports. And so um, as a staff, we're going to be looking at what are the expectations at BFA and how can we support our kids in meeting those. Um, 
Uh, communications to parents has gone out. The welcome back letter went out. Um, if you hear any feedback, like I wish they had sent this out. I would love to hear that because I was trying to think of it through my parent lens on, like what would I want to know if my kid was coming in a ninth grader. Um, but you know, sometimes we miss pieces, so I would love any feedback that you ever if you get any. Um, so that went out. Um, we have moved freshman orientation night to the 18th of September. Historically, it's been right at the beginning of in-service. And so we have received some questions like, why did we decide to do that? And um, the answers we have been given is, I don't know if you have kids that have come to BFA, but usually that night is the hottest night of the year. And you have parents and kids lost looking for this classroom that exists somewhere in one of the two buildings. Um, and it's really fast, really quick, and so we thought, why don't we integrate um, a week, which is this week, of freshman um, tours, so kids can come in the building, with small groups with their parents or without, walk around the building, and then we also have, um, we're gonna do a freshman only first day, where they can come in, small groups, get to know where their rooms are, get to see their teachers, and then when orientation happens, they can bring their parents around and show them where their classes are and who their teachers are, opposed to this like blind leading the blind kind of feel that like we were doing. <laughs> so um, we're, we're hoping that, that that's um, a good way to start. And then um, facilities. My list is long, BFA is a big place, and so Len was, was giving me the rundown, but the, the biggies are um, access, we are moving all of our access to the cloud. Um, so um, key uh, badge readers will be placed at all of the doors and it will allow us to basically have more security. Um, as you know, you know, as people come and go, they sometimes take their keys with them. And this whole system will, that will be um, something of the past where we can shut badges off, um, if we're in a lockdown or, or some kind of emergency um, situation, the card readers can be shut off for everybody except the police. Um, so it definitely gives us more security for the building. Um, we also had a lots of retiling, repainting, um, resurfacing of floors, um, lots of uh, people moving around in different rooms, so some changes had to happen, um, some new lighting, um, and a boiler, um, partial boiler, um, fix in the north building, which we have a part on back order, so let's hope the snow doesn't fly soon. <laughs> and so, um, uh, and also I've been told PCB testing is slated for the end of September, as we know from the state, that's a moving target, um, so that is what's up for facilities. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can go next. I'm Queenie Ann Wright, the director of Northwest Career Tech Center. Um, we do not have summer programming, um, but we took advantage of the students that were touring PFA and also some of the middle school programs and gave them tours as needed or as they wanted. And that includes out-of-district students because our sending schools aren't only BFA, but it's also MPU, and we also have students that come from BFA Fairfax. I supervise the BFA driver's ed uh, program, and um, Holly, whenever you want that back, just let me know. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, to report out how that works, um, we had 28 students that completed the spring program, so that was in May and June. We had 29 students that just completed the session that happened in July and August, and then we have a fall session that started in September 25. You probably hear from community members that driver's ed is always behind, that's always behind, but that's not the case anymore with Paul Cotto. Uh, so send them to me if uh, you hear that. Uh, I also wanted to tell you that we have several students from our school that are employed within the district. So they're in our school, but not to learn, but actually to work. So we have actually nine employees that are either custodians, they were camp counselors, or they are going to be educational support staff, or they were educational support mm -hmm. staff. So I thought that was um, interesting mm -hmm. for you to know. We also have adult career training that's offered year round. Lisa DeRocher has that up. And we have a statewide contract with new trans. So their employees take our welding training, and we have one course this, this summer. 
We also had emergency medical technician class that took place and that uh, ended this month. And we also had a phlebotomy course, that ended this month. We also have individual classes called end to go So those are uh, online learning modules that range anywhere from being a medical assistant to some computer programming. So uh, professional uh, development for us will consist of either the restorative practice, which is what the district um, is supporting us in, um, or, or it's literacy for us. So our staff actually had the choice to choose between the two, um, and then which was last year, and then they'll have to do the other, which would be this, um, this year for the professional development. So we are working on aligning the English language um, uh, proficiencies or standards within the programs. So we'll be bringing those to our sending schools and asking them to recognize that um, once we have that alignment done. That's a lot of work if, um, if you haven't worked with the curriculum before. Um, for staff, we have two new staff um, to our school, and then we have two staff members that are transitioning within the district. Um, and we also have um, paraeducators para um, that, are, that are from NCTC within the district, which I can talk to you about. For our in-service, um, we are all kind of aligned with the team building and the restorative practices approach, uh, our student learning goals. Uh, NCTC, or CTE in general, is held to a different standard than other schools. Um, it almost feels like it's a higher standard, no offense to my colleagues. Um, it's it's um, been a challenge, and Bill can put us to the um, challenge that we've had, um, but we must meet state targets. We have very specific accountability measures. Uh, some examples of these measures are tracking the number of our concentrators, and concentrators are students that are in their second year of the program. We have to track of various accountability measures, I'm happy to report to you at a different time on all of them. Uh, we have to track uh, that they earn college credit, or dual enrollment as we call it, within our, within our programs. And we also have to track uh, post-secondary credentials, which another word for that is industry-recognized credentials within each one of our programs. And um, an example of um, last year's data, we don't have this year's data yet for last year, so it actually is the year before. Um, the target for the college credit was 29%, so they wanted 29% of our concentrators or our second year students to earn college credit, and we had 49% of our students that earned college credit. So half of our, basically our seniors, had college credit within all of their programs. The post-secondary credentials, the state target was 21%, and our um, our number was 39%, which was actually low for us. We usually have a very high percentage of the industry recognized credentials. Usually it's in the 70s. <clears throat> um, I also wanted you to know that we were above the state um, statewide rate of all of our system centers, and there's 16 centers, so we're bragging there. <laughs> uh, like my counterparts, we also have statewide testing. Um, high stakes testing, and ours is called Work Keys, and we have those assessments in math and literacy. And so Work Keys is an assessment that measures the foundational skills required for success in the workplace, and it helps measure the workplace skills that can affect job performance. And so we're measured on that as well. Looking at parents and community, uh, we will participate in all of our area uh, open houses, so we will um, be there at the BFA open house. And it provides us an opportunity to showcase who we are and what we do. A lot of the freshmen aren't necessarily looking to come to the Tech Center for programs, but we'll be there to answer questions um, for parents that might want to consider it as, they, um, as their child moves up um, in the grades. Usually that night they're just so focused on it's their first year of high school, they just want to figure out their classes and they're not thinking ahead. But we, we actually do have a handful of parents that are pushing their, their child to consider um, what they want to do when they grow up. Um, for the community, so uh, we are, we have a close knit relationship with our community, um, particularly business and industry, because we rely on them for job shadows and career work experiences and externships for our students. We want them to explore options so that they don't enroll in a college for four years and decide it's not what they want to do. So it's, it's really important for us to have those positive relationships within the community. Uh, so that we can support our students and the families to be successful in college and careers. And lastly, for building improvements, um, Len our and our maintenance team are amazing. They work tirelessly all summer long. They actually had a calendar this year, which is the first time I've ever seen that, of where they were going to be and when. Uh, we have a new curbside appeal 
when you come to our school, you'll see we have two new signs, one facing the road and another right in front of our school. We also have new concrete steps and railings. Um, it looks really, really good. Um, and we also have fresh paint around our school. So there wasn't really a lot done inside of our school this year because we've been doing a little bit every year, but our outside curb appeal looks real good. Thank you. All right, I guess I'm last, right? <laughs> um, so at City this summer, um, our highlight was our camps. And I think what I've been told is that's usually our summer highlight. That's when I came in. But we had over 200 kids every week at camp. It was a four-week camp. Uh, the first session, the first two weeks, we had 25 different camps. Um, we had hip-hop dance, we had cooking, we had pre-K, kindergarten, bay camp, fishing camp, uh, cheer camp, cheer camp, cheer <laughs> camp. Um, uh, Stacy and I had to uh, sing and dance to earn tickets for the bakery kids. They did a little uh, bakery for the community and parents got to answer questions and Stacy and I got to sing and dance um, to earn our supper that day. But it was a lot of fun. Um, our second session of camp, we had 20 camps. Those were for our older kids. Again, we had cheer, we had them around the dance, we had fishing, art, that's also uh, Minecraft. Um, those older kids, basketball and wrestling as well. It's the first time we've had wrestling. Um, and that was, that was very exciting. Lots of positive feedback from the kids. They enjoyed that a lot. Our camps are funded through 21st century. Um, so that's a little different funding category than the ESSER. Um, and Mark and Wendy did a really great job making sure that it ran very smoothly. Um, with that, um, facility, we've been working on a lot of facility improvements um, this year. Uh, special shout out to our custodial staff because they have worked very, very hard. Our building is 53 years old, and so um, sometimes she shows her wear. And so we've had lots of painting going on to kind of um, cover up her, you know, wear and tear. She's, she's an old people to goodie, and so got to take care of her. Um, we have a new handicapped accessible ramp that should be, it will be completed before school starts with the students. The uh, railings are the only thing left to be installed, and they should be here Friday. Um, and that's in the front, so that increases our access. Um, we have been working on uh, improving our faculty relaxation space. It was over in a side closet by the gym. Um, that wasn't very relaxing. Um, and so we have moved that closer to the faculty lounge. It also serves some um, needs of our, our teachers that are mothers as well. Um, we have uh, installed our inclusive playground equipment, so we're excited. Lots of the kids have already had a chance to play on it, so that's a positive. And we just finished putting in some planner boxes um, uh, in various locations towards the front. They're nice, brand new cedar ones, and soon they will be filled when the kids return. Um, some of the communities will plant those for us. Um, we also uh, are welcoming new staff. I think uh, we take the lead in that. We have 22 new teachers coming in. Um, two of our ESPs have actually uh, graduated to the S classroom teachers. We're excited for them. Um, to welcome them, uh, we did new teacher orientation this week at our building. We also took a bus tour of the community. Uh, to, for them to see uh, where our students uh, live and interact. We got to wave at some kids as well, uh, get a history tour. Our tour guide was very excellent as well. Um, uh, and lots of positive feedback. Our mentors arrived as well, um, gave them some mentor mentee time, and they rode the bus with us. Um, and they also had positive feedback from, from the bus tour. Um, with that, so that was exciting um, to start that process. We do have some changes this year, as, as everyone does. We've adjusted our arrival and dismissal procedures, um, to make them a little bit more organized, a little bit safer, and um, also to increase our capacity of the number of vehicles at drop-off and pick-up, so we're not backing up traffic quite so bad. And we've let parents know about that in the letter that is gone out to them today as well, included some maps. So do anticipate a little uh, hiccups to start with, but we really will go, we'll be able to move 80 cars 
much more efficiently. Um, so we think that will help with some other issues we've had in the past. Um, we've also relocated some classrooms. Um, we've relocated the AP office, so that's a little bit more private and also conducive to us as admin being closer together, which allowed us to free up spaces for intervention, um, particularly our speech and language, some teletherapy, <coughs> Um, and our interventionist as well, and special ed intervention spaces. Um, we've increased those um, significantly throughout the school. And we are very excited to be working on some school improvement items, particularly um, our literacy um, and math group work. We're going to have some structures that involve our entire school community in doing that, which will be a little new for us. We are doing a faculty book study called Extreme Ownership. Um, some people have already dipped into their books, so uh, we'll be talking about that. Um, we also have um, an improved chicken coop with some new chickens, and the kids are very excited about the new chickens. So from the student voice, that, that's a highlight of their year so far. And then we have a grand year of the book that our librarian, Ashley Levine, is running. And that brings authors into the building, but it also puts free books into kids' hands. Um, and we had a trial run of that this summer, and the kids were very excited, and the author was excited to get to speak to our kids. So those are the things that we're super excited about to start the school year. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any questions? Great information. <laughs> All right, so I guess there's, since there's no questions, we're going to move on to um, the MRUSD objectives, key results, and measurements. I'm going to hand that over to you. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to be taking that. Um, John can be with us tonight. And I really want to say this represents the work of the whole team. We don't have the entire team here tonight. Um, but a lot of this work has been going on since last spring, and it's really a team effort. And not just the leadership team, but their leadership teams in every school uh, gave feedback, whether it's the program leaders at BFA or the, I know we have different names at different schools. I don't have them all in my head right now. But, um, there's been a lot of back and forth, and I would ask my colleagues if I miss something, just give me the evil eye or throw something at me or say, hey, Bill, you're missing this. Um, Tonight, I wanted to give you an overview on this. I wanted to be able to give this to the board. You've asked us for our goals and what are our goals. So this is our yearly goals. Some of you know is smart know about SMART goals. We've been using, uh, we've taken something that has all the same components, but is used a different one. We call, we like to uh, loving, lovingly call them ochres, is what John kind of gets us into, and we kind of joke about it as a team. Er, ochres. Uh, is what we do, but um, it's really about objective key results and success measures. Um, and some of this we couldn't set till we had all the spring data from this year. So um, this will come in more as we talk about goals for the district and strategic planning, and I'll talk more about that organization at another, another meeting and how that all works. So uh, Aaron, are you on the slides, or is it Martin? Yeah, okay, Martin, is, thanks, Martin. So just kind of the process, we started in late February, early March, reviewing the, the winter student assessment data that we had uh, that's all connected to the envisioning plan. The envisioning plan that this board approved two years ago will sunset the end of this school year. And that's because it's in alignment with the ESSER money that came from all the COVID relief money that we had to have an envisioning plan that was set by the state and what areas we had to work. Um, as some of my colleagues said up there, it was really about um, social emotional learning and student health, uh, engagement and academic uh, success. So those are the three areas for that plan. Um, so as I said, the district team, we worked together. And then uh, this summer, because we didn't have the spring data until the end of June, we worked in our retreat to set these success measures that you've seen, you've seen a paper that's on all this. I'm just showing you in a PowerPoint really about the same things. Just want to give you some vocabulary here that I think that's really uh, to understand this because uh, I know myself I can get technical into this and kind of get into that educator ease and, and say things and not really define them well. So the objectives are the goal for the year. The key results are milestones that we're going to use throughout the year to track our progress. 
Um, and our success measures are telling us, are we having an impact on students and staff? Are we really getting the impact? So our milestones may not be measuring necessarily student learning, they may be measuring something else that's on the way because the student, we're gonna look at spring to spring data, even though we collect data in the fall, the winter, and the spring, students. So, uh, I didn't know. So our two objectives that we set, um, and this really came from the team, and uh, we struggled for a little bit because we were trying to struggle to figure out pre-K-8 and high school, uh, but we were able to come together and really set this as to two objectives, and the first one, build a supportive school culture of high expectations for behavior, engagement, and academics, and building a guaranteed and viable curriculum with a concentration focus on literacy. I will tell you that one of the things that's an aside to that, that building that guaranteed and viable curriculum, we're doing in, um, we're focusing on literacy, but as you know and you've heard from John and Alexis in the past with social emotional learning and our content areas, we are focusing on making sure that we have our curricula set in all our curricular areas. So we really, we focus on social emotional literacy and math. Uh, we've done work in other areas, but sometimes with the availability and resources we have, we've had to slow down some of the other content areas. So that will be finishing this year. <clears throat> so if, if you want to go on to the next slide. Can I just ask yeah, a quick, yeah. quick, and it doesn't have to be answered right now, yeah. it can be answered later. Um, or maybe it's not even answerable right now. I, we, everybody just got a chance to kind of update us on where you're at, um, and we heard all the good news. We, we didn't hear what positions do you not have filled, how is that going to impact your literacy goals. Um, I would imagine, you know, special ed, SLPs, um, interventionists, so on and so forth. And so when we're looking at all these things, I just think it would be also important for us to be real transparent with our communities, you know, about what we don't have. And it's not to anybody's, you know, fault, <laughs> but it's just being open and honest about what we don't have and, and how that will impact, you know. So I was going to give our, you a result. Becky and I were going to give you a hiring report during the okay. superintendent's report. Great. Yep, I'll give you an update there. Um, so the first objective, build a supportive school culture of high expectations for behavior and engagement. Some of our key results that we'll be looking at, uh, there's five of them here, you'll see them with each. Um, and really looking at that, uh, all staff will engage in components of restorative practices, professional development. As of the end of in-service, um, this in-service before school starts, we'll have um, 182 plus our new teachers. I'm trying to remember, do you, Alex, do you remember how many new staff are going through RP roughly? So 80, 182 plus 25 will be our staff that have been through restorative practices and our goal is to, um, is to get all our staff trained this year with that. Um, we may have to extend that a little bit, but that's our goal. Uh, es establishing uh, RP teams at each school to oversee RP implementation. Um, this next one of having youth RP teams in each school. And then build our in-house capacity to leave restorative processes for harm and conflict. We've been able to do that, we're really trying to get that deeper. We've been doing that, but really deep in that. And then um, something that started last spring um, that Alexis was leading us through was really reviewing our district procedures, handbooks, and other related documents and revise them to be in alignment with restorative practices. Um, that work has been done by my colleagues. I, I don't think I heard anyone saying that. I know you all were doing that really hard to let's make this really in line with what we have in our in our procedures is in alignment with our restorative practice philosophy. So our next area is to build a guaranteed viable curriculum. So um, really we're looking at whole school adoption. You've heard about Amplify pre-K-8. Uh, We'll have John come in and give us some more data. We've had some very encouraging data from this past year uh, for teachers that have uh, been able to implement that in their classroom and the effect that's had for student learning and the outcomes. Um, implementation, this next one's really important to us and uh, it's the implementation of new guidelines for protected time for learning. So as you heard last spring, that it means 120 minutes in pre-K three for literacy, uh, 90 minutes, four through six, or four through five, I'm looking at my colleagues, four through six, and uh, 
60 minutes from sixth grade, from seventh grade on up. Six or eight, well, it's all the way up through high school. That, that's not 60 minutes, yeah. And then 60 minutes for math. So um, I know my colleagues have done a lot of work in rescheduling their schools to meet that. And it's not been easy. Um, it's been really tough, actually. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that instructional time is there. And then collaborative time, well, we've had PLCs and processes going in the past. We're really trying to get that unified across the district. Um, our coaches have been great leads in that, our instructional coaches. And so we're really going to be doing that this year. And then um, we, you've heard in the past our feedback that we're getting back on our choice-based professional development for literacy, UDL, that's Universal Design of Learning, restorative practices, and math. Um, and it's really been positively impacting teachers' professional practice from what they've told us back. We're getting 80 to 85 percent agreement that it's impacting in a positive way. Um, I heard that from one of our teacher colleagues tonight as he was talking about what he was doing today. Sorry, Mike, I'm poking at you a little bit, but I heard you were positive about it. So, um, and then align academic components within CT, as you heard Leanne talk about. Um, one of the things that uh, she's really under and We'll have Leanne come back and, and tell you a little bit more about the, how the federal regulations push all the way down to a CTE center. They're probably they are stricter than what, in my knowledge of anything, of uh, anything else in education in Vermont, and really down to exact some very exacting time constraints for CTEs. So, uh, the next slide. Then this summer we got a chance to take a look at our data from last year to this year, spring to spring. And I don't know if you heard, last week there was a nice article in WCAX that talked about attendance rates across the nation and what's going on. And they talk about accept, an acceptable attendance rate is that students at school 95% of the time. So that's nine absences. And a student is in, critical, um, is in a critical area, area if they're absent more than 10% of the time. So that's 17 absences. Right now in the nation, about, um, I think I heard what it said was about 45% of the school, no, sorry, 40% of the schools in the nation have, I have this backwards, I'm sorry. The average, the mean in this nation is that about 40% of the students are at school and that 95%. So you can see that in 2021 to 22, we were at 26%. We're now up to 44%. Um, our behavior, and this is one of the things that we're using, we're working on right now, is getting better definitions. And this team worked really hard this summer to do that, um, and, and to try to really define across schools what we mean by behavior instances. We even call them majors and minors, and um, that's some great work that's been done, led by Alexis again. And what our data is telling us is that you can see it right there that we're in that 90 to 90 percent range for both years for students that have fewer than four major instances uh, a year. That has been tracked. And one of the things I'll say about our data, um, this is the data we have. Some people might say, well, is that a, how valid is it? It's as valid as what we have. We try to make it better every year. Um, You'll see the literacy impact, the literacy percent on grade level. Uh, that's done with our local assessments that we use across all schools, and same with our math. So you can see the increases there were four and six percent. So from that, we wanted to, when you talk about SMART goals, they talk about being specific, measurable, attainable, they are as reliable and timely. The big thing is really attainable, and one of the, the biggest factor that's been shown to increase student learning is that staff have a sense of collective efficacy, or they believe their impact, their work, will impact student learning. So it's really important to make goals that are attainable. Um, and so we had a lot of conversation about this here in August at our retreat. And so you'll see the success measures that are there. Um, some of them are student measured and some of them are staff measured. Most of them are student measured, but that 95% positive response rate for our professional learning evaluation indicators. 70% of our students are on track for attendance at that 5% or fewer. Right now we're in 44. Um, that 
we have 85% of our students on track for behavior, and that's really looking at the MTSS model. You've had presentations in the past of MTSS, and really 85% of our students, either in behavior or academics, we should be servicing them with our tier one system. So that's kind of where that number came from. 45% uh, of our students on track for literacy on grade level and 50% on math, which is a 10% increase. And if you have 20 kids in your room, that's improving two kids that are beyond grade level. And if you remember from John's presentation, I could be on grade level, say I'm a fourth grader, but I could be all the way down to third grade because there's a plus or minus one there. So. Um, you can't get any really more specific than that. Our assessments won't allow us to get that specific. Um, increase our SEL survey results from 73% to 80% in a sense of belonging. Question, how to, are you connected? How do you feel you're connected to adults in your school? And then um, that all our instructional minutes, that we meet all our targets and guidelines, and that our collaboration times and protocols, protocols and processes that are developed by our instructional call, coaches are followed throughout the year. So those are our success measures. So back to the yeah. previous slide. So for literacy and math, 22-23, 40% of the students were on grade level. Yep. And that's right along with the national average? National average is actually lower than that. It's 35% right now, measured by the name. I wish it were better. We all, we struggled. We were like, that That seems too low for us to set for a goal. But I do want to say we talked about attainable. Yeah. And yeah. we're like, can, uh, Stephanie, can I use your, your, or maybe say your model of what you said about teachers and encourage them in the classroom. So, um, I, just, I came from a district in Georgia. We were um, a federally identified school for school improvement. And so we are looking at achievement rates in the 30s, low 40s very discouraging for teachers because we want to be successful. That's unacceptable to have that many kids below. And if you, your goal's too high, you don't ever get to it. You don't see any forward progress. But most teachers, all of, all of the teachers I've ever worked with, I can move three kids. That doesn't seem unattainable. That's something I can work with. There's always three kids with that you teach that are close you know just a one more question right a couple a little bit more extra tutoring or help or we'll put you here and make sure you get that and if every teacher commits to three kids you can get 12 percent gain you can really move and the, and what i've also found after three years of doing that type of work if i can get three i'll, I'll go get this. three more and then you got people that are real competitive and they're like, oh, I got, I'm gonna go get some more. And then what you've also done is moving forward, you keep building more and more kids towards grade level competency. Um, and as you're predicting and tracking throughout the year, success is building on success. We get a chance to really celebrate that we're moving those kids forward. But if you go ahead and go, hey, we're at 40%, but we wanna be at 90%, you're, yeah, yeah, no, that makes Statistically, sense. that's going to be extremely difficult. Yeah. That was a lot of our conversation was like, what's really reasonable? Um, Bill, if we could go back a couple slides to the the uh, key results. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So we could, <clears throat> there's the two, one for behavior, and then there's yeah. the one for. Uh, um, this is the one. Is this the one you wanted? Yeah. It, either either one, but yeah. yeah, this is a good one to, to yeah. begin with. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is possible or not, but just one thing, you know, as we've been talking about the um, creative discourse, uh, the goals that we're establishing there, and then our board goals, just one thing that I, I guess, would like to see, or I wonder if it could be reflected here, is just another key result around engagement, right? Um, making sure that we're communicating all of this information to uh, families, to mm -hmm. home, and making sure that there's um, ways, maybe even some kind of um, assessments, um, making sure that people are receiving information, they understand what their you know young people are working towards, whatnot. But just really, really making sure that there's better engagement there, because that's one of our main goals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. in both in both of these two areas. Yeah. Good point. 
Any other, Charlie? Uh, yeah, I just have a question on the uh, success measures. Mm -hmm. Are those uh, the, are, are those intended to be attainable like within this 23, 24 school year, or is the what's the, the hardest one probably up there is the attendance. Yeah, that's the hardest one. We uh, we that's just but that's where we were again lots of conversation we had a i'm going to talk about there in superintendent's report again but we had a great retreat and it was really like where can we put that number yeah. and not i mean if we looked at our attendance rates before covid that's below it so you know it's it's really you know what's obtainable where should we be at so, so a lot of our conversations so the goal on these is ideally we get this report next year and these are the numbers that you know show up so yeah the, it would be nice to say we met all those that's what we hit now we're making our new ones but it's not like a three-year plan no it's not three this is a one year this is one year set of goals okay yep this is one year this is and it's that piece i said earlier about being attainable mm -hmm. for this year yep. this is this is 2023-24 so in a 70% greater attendance than prior to COVID? Uh, no. Prior to COVID, we had higher. Did I okay. say it the wrong way? I may have said it the wrong okay. way. But no. prior to COVID, we had higher than 70%. Okay. I, didn't, I haven't gone back to look at the reports. But all right. anyway, we all felt pretty comfortable that we were better. And I, I look at my colleagues who were here with me at that time. We had pretty good attendance rates. Yeah, But it just became socially acceptable mm -hmm. for kids just not to come to school. And that's what I mean about that whole engagement piece, you know, mm -hmm. right? Like putting back out to the parents. This, this is where we were this year, you know? I think people would be shocked to hear what the numbers were, and that might raise people's awareness and, and, and buy-in to make sure that their kids are getting to school because the numbers were not just for Maple Run, all over. Scary. Any other questions, anyone? Can we do like a breakdown of like, I'm just curious like what schools are having attendance issues? All. Like, all. Even all. All. No. Absolutely. It's not, it's not a certain school. Yeah. So the, I didn't know. Like, no, 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 it's a good question. question. It's a new question. I'm going to skip school today. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's everywhere. everywhere. It's everywhere. Really? Yep. Alrighty. It's people going on vacations during school. During the school year. I mean, that happens all the time. People are gone for two weeks because they're on vacation. It's because they can't afford to go on vacation during a school break. It's, it's everything. It's medical. It's, I mean, there's all sorts of things, but it's across the board. So I know this. We'll come back a couple times a year and report on this this year. Uh, where we're at, um, as I said, our data, student data gets refreshed in the fall and in the winter and in the spring. And you've seen some of those reports in the past. Did I miss anything, colleagues? I don't need that. Mm -hmm. We're all good. Yeah, can you just start? Can I just add one quick piece? Go. Cool. That's why I asked there's the question. Of, just because there's a lot of conversation around engagement in truancy, and I just think it's important to highlight that. Truancy is a symptom, and we need to remember that. So truancy is a symptom of an obstacle, a barrier that is in place for that youth, that family. So it's it's a big task because it's really you want to get the root out, you know, solving the engagement issue is identifying those obstacles and those barriers, um, whatever they may be. And some of our families have many barriers and many obstacles in place for that. And I can speak for like the high school. Um, I was just having this conversation with a student just the other day. Is when COVID happened, I always say it was all the work and none of the fun, right? And so kids have now translated that school is now work. And if you hand in your work, I don't really need to be there. And so we have kind of this culture that we're fighting against after COVID where it's like, no, it actually matters that you're in the building, right? And that you're here and that there's more to school than just checking off whether the assignment is complete. Um, so we're just kind of really trying to build back that culture. But I would say that that's probably also a large part of at least high school. I'm curious if that culture, like what effect that culture has uh, based on the fact that uh, remote 
like adults are more and more not in at their at their workplace or well their workplace is now right. more and more at their home and I'm wondering like there's a sense of okay well you can do you can do everything an adult needs to do right. from from the home office yeah I know exactly um, mm -hmm. that idea right I mean and there's some validity to that when they see their parents working from home right and they're getting their work done and they get a paycheck and then it's like but it's this idea that they're youth and that there's social skills and relationships and and all of those services that they could be getting at school that they would not be getting at home. Um, but just really kind of understanding that it is more than just handing them a right. so. And I would imagine like the social anxiety stuff that came along with COVID, yeah. mm -hmm. that's still wrecking kids. Mm -hmm. She's going to talk about this. Yes, yeah. All right, so any other questions about information? So the next um, point of business is a superintendent, uh, superintendent evaluation. And you're going to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Okay. Do you want to? Sure. We're going to distribute a hard copy of the superintendent performance evaluation survey uh, today. Uh, so you have, a, you have that hard copy, but you're also going to receive, if you haven't already, a link to the Google form okay. document. And that Google form document is, is really what I, I'm looking to get back from, from you, from the board. Uh, my suggestion is that you take the paper copy uh, and complete the evaluation on that paper copy and then transform that into the Google form. Um, it's the easiest way, in my opinion, to capture your feedback and your scoring in that document instead of trying to review the form as you're trying to uh, input your information. You'll notice as you navigate that Google form, there's uh, the majority of the sections are required specifically around the scoring. Um, the comments space is a free form and it's not a requirement, so just know that. My ask of the board is that you have 30 days to complete the um, Google form um, and it will be submitted um, and I'm going to do some check-ins with, with the board uh, to see how things are going over the next 30 day window. So September 18th is the due date on that form. Any questions? I don't think so, but I think that then, so we'll have the Google form and all the information will be um, collated or whatever we want to mm -hmm. call it. And then I think it's going to be me and a couple of board members to sit down and, and, and finish the evaluation, basically. So I'm also looking for you know, one or two board members that would be interested in helping with that. So I don't need an answer right now, but um, definitely in the next couple of weeks, if you want to be thinking about that so that we can plan to sit down. Okay, okay perfect. I think I already have this, but. Can I just add that, yeah. and maybe Becky. No. No, I know it's not my process, but I just want, I think it should be in public session that the leadership team will be doing the same evaluation. It'll be anonymous. I don't get to see any of this. This is why it all works through Becky and the works with the board members to complete that. They're chuckling. I know they're chuckling. I, I can understand the chuckles. Happy to answer any questions as you work through the document. Any questions about that? All right, moving on to the board retreat update. Yes. Um, so back in June, uh, we had, we were already, in, uh, I again thank the board for uh, pausing that retreat as I was quite ill at that point. Um, but we handed out both electronically and in paper, and Carly, we have extra copies here tonight of the first two chapters of a book about board work and board development. Um, and so I know, Aaron, you brought a couple extras. So we have them 
afterwards. And we're going to be working with Tracy Wren next Monday at the museum. We had to, unfortunately, couldn't get hard at it. was already booked for Monday night. Um, so we'll be up at the museum, up on the third floor. Um, and what, as you read the, the first and second chapter, and, you, and Tracy said to me, I'm just reading her email, they can skip the section on superintendent search because I think they're all set on that. Um, <laughs> but as I read, uh, if they can mark three big ideas, and I'll send this in an email to you tomorrow morning, okay. two phrases that you have questions on or wonder about, and one phrase that represents the strength of the MRUSD board. And I'll literally just forward you this so you have those Great. in writing. Um, and we're going to get going right at 5.30 and go to 8. Uh, we'll be at the museum, as I said. Uh, we'll have some dinner, a light dinner there for you as well. Um, and I know that uh, Tracy's fully trained in restorative practices, so we'll be starting in a circle for probably the first 45 minutes uh, with some restorative conversations. Great. And this is, this is just the historical museum? Yeah, this is St. Albans Museum. On uh, the street. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Charlie, <laughs> it's, if you're like me and you're the closest, you're usually the last one to the left. That's what I do. Yeah. 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 That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the plan. The plan is to do that. Um, you also have that we gave out last meeting. I'll make sure we have copies of it, of all the board operational policies governance policies that you adopted in the past 18 months. It was really about 18 months ago. I was looking at that the other day. Um, and something that Carly got to see that, and Jess, Jessica got to see, and Susan, is we have a matrix of those crosswalking with the Vermont School Board Essentials Workbook, which actually will give you some detail, because I know you want to talk about board goals, and those would be a really good place to look. Susan, what am I missing for the retreat? Did we talk about the um, pulling up that when we were in that um, educational session? Yeah. The rubric or whatever you call them for um, board goals. Remember that sheet of paper? I remember us looking at it was the what I brought with me tonight that we had was from the governance standards self evaluation. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Do you want me? You, I can make sure this is distributed electronically to everybody and then bring copies of it yeah. if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I will do this. Okay. Yep. Great. Because I think we already have a copy of it. I think you do, because yeah. I know you brought it right yeah. after that meeting. Yeah. But I'll bring the governance self-assessment standards. Yep. Alrighty. Any questions? Any other questions about the retreat? All right, so um, moving on to new business. And we need to take action on the FY24 extracurricular and co-curricular co guidelines. So um, we're looking to uh, for a motion to approve the co-curricular and ex extracurricular guidelines for FY24. Um, historically, these guidelines have re or these, yeah have received a step advancement every other year. This year, there was no step advancement, um, and new guidelines. Guide, the new guidelines reflect a step advancement for next year. So I'm looking for some, I'll make that motion if someone would second it. I'll set Charlie. Uh, now discussion. Rebecca and Martha are your sure. folks on that. Can you talk to us about that? Well, the only thing we changed in the guidelines was the, um, the rate of pay. So in FY23, which is last school year, there was no step advancement for the step schedules. For FY24, which is now the new school year, uh, we have put in place a step advancement. We have also, on the um, cells where there is no step system, we put a 3% increase on there as well. Any questions? Discussion? So, if there isn't any discussion, I think we can take a vote on that. And since we're all here, we can just go around the table. Jack? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Katie? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Carly? Yes. Susan? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that motion has moved forward. <clears throat> so the next thing we need to talk about is the adult breakfast meal price increase. The administration recommends a motion to increase the adult breakfast meal price to 270 
five per the two dollars and seventy five cents per the agency of education. So I'll make that motion if someone wants to second it. Charlie. Uh, so so yes. yes. So we just recently received our information from the USDA for the FY24 reimbursement rates. And once we received that information, we were informed um, by the Child Nutrition Group at AOE that our adult breakfast price needed to be increased. And so that's why we're bringing this back to you, which we had already brought you the other prices um, earlier. So we're, we're looking to increase the breakfast price. It was at, I think, 250. We're going to 275. Any questions or discussion, Charlie? So this is a federally mandated 25 cent increase? Basically, yes, because you can't um, provide meals to staff and or students that are paying for the meals at a lesser rate of pay than what this, the feds are reimbursing for the, for the free meals. Okay. Okay. We can't be subsidizing with the child nutrition program. Any other questions? Alrighty. So I think we're ready to vote on that. Joe? Yes. Linda? Susan? Yes. Carly? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Katie? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Jack? Yes. All right, so that also passes. Oh, it's yes for food. So other business, um, the warrants, the administration recommends a motion to approve the warrants, acknowledging that the passage of this motion will act as authorization and signature of any individual board members participating remotely. So I'm going to make that motion to approve the warrants, acknowledging the passage. But the motion will act as authorization and signature of any board members participating remotely. Um, Can someone second that for me? Second. Amanda. And... Uh, any Jack, discussion? Jack has some right now. So. Okay. Jack, um, I'm going to take a vote on this. Yes. 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 All right, so that also uh, moves forward. So, superintendent. Superintendent's report. Okay. Um, so first I kind of, I alluded to it in the uh, report on the objective key results and uh, success measures. Um, we had a great retreat and uh, it's quite a, a leadership team that Maple Run, that you as a board should be really proud of. They are doing great work, great work together, really collaborative and just really excited uh, for the work we have in front of us. Um, I feel very fortunate to work with all of them. They're a tremendous team. I know I feel very supported, and uh, I hope you're proud of the work that you'll see from them this year. And I know you were of the work they did last year. Um, so just really good that way. Uh, the second thing is I did bring some information here. Just need to flip to it. Um, and Becky, please help me out with this, because I asked you for some summary, and you may know some details. Sure. Uh, and then our colleagues may be able to help as well for their buildings. Um, we, in the... Um, since a, since August 1, we, on Monday, um, one of my colleagues alluded to the new teacher orientation which started on Monday and is continuing tomorrow and Thursday, um, let me say it, tomorrow and Friday, uh, we had 45 new teachers at orienti orientation. Uh, since October 1st, we've had 11 new hires, three in special ed, three, seven, eight, one, nine, 12, and one K3 teacher. Uh, we have some pending hires right now in English, um, social worker, and hopefully automotive, um, but we're still working on those right now. Those are kind of pending. Um, we are right now down about 14 professionals. Um, six of those are pretty key positions. Four of them we have candidates in the, in the track right now. One of them I actually know we're down to three because one of them just got hired since this report this afternoon or just said yes. Um, so we're working on that. We have we are missing uh, some special educators, some SLPs. We're doing we're going to be doing some SLP uh, services remotely. Um, we're down quite a few ESPs. Um, I know there were some ESP interviews. I know it. And remember, the numbers I'm giving you is the last end of the hiring process. So we're at 18, uh, according to today, from the data poll. Um, 
And we have, if you know anyone that wants to be an accounts payable person, we're down, we have zero. We, I think we might have one applicant now after three or four weeks. Uh, we are, just to give you a point, Becky went out and did this, and sorry, Becky, I'm kind of giving your information, but it was great. Gives you an idea of the hiring climate. Um, we're trying to hire an accounts payable. There were, what, 12 positions in Franklin County? 12 positions within 25 miles of St. Albans. They're looking for an accounts They're payable. They're looking for an accounts payable. That's the competition level right now. Yeah. And, and you said we're right in the right place salary-wise. Well, when um, those competitors, because that's what I'm going to call them, there are competitors, posted their salary ranges, we're, we're at the high end of the range of what others are looking for. Um, but that's just the climate that we're in right now, as everyone knows. So, um, we're, we're trying everything, kept jumping out there in a banana costume, we're trying to find it. And we would do that if we could I think it would have some success. I'm sure you've seen some of the social media that Becky's been leading us with. But we're out there, Facebook, Instagram. Those are, we don't know yet, but we're going to try to figure out that's getting us more people than other methods, than traditional methods. Becky, what have I, or colleagues, what have I missed that's key hiring? Joanna had a, a great question. Is there anything that's key that we're worried about that's going to impact our work? For us, it's having enough PSPs to support our, our students with some significant needs. We're cutting it close to the wire. We've cut it really close to the wire for having a whole teaching staff. Um, and, and so that is a little nerve-wracking, um, so we like to start late uh, either. Um, we're having some parents start to call us with some questions, um, particularly for our students that have some one-to-ones. Um, and so, we can be hitting the door August 30th. We need to be welcoming new staff August 30th with them, and that's, that's, that's hard. And so, and making sure that um, the grown-ups are up to speed so they can hit the road running um, is going to affect the, the quality that we're, that we're giving and building those relationships um, between the ESPs and the staff that directs them as well. It's going to take a little bit longer. They don't get that kind of meet and greet and feel each other out. It's hit the road and set off and make magic happen. And for PSA, we, were miss we are missing a um, building-based special ed coordinator. Um, and, for, and the impact it would have on that is just really coordinating what those interventions and supports are for all of our special ed education programs. Um, we have uh, alternative programs like the Lighthouse, um, which is in special ed, but alternative programs and then Novus, which, so just bringing kind of a um, system to that would definitely and we're in a similar position um, as city. We're in better shape than we were last year at this time, but um, you know we're still like we've been interviewing, and you know if they have jobs, they've got to get notice. So starting school, we're keeping our fingers crossed. But then we also have we have you know we have new children that move in, right? That need okay. significant help, and we're trying to figure that out. So um, anyway, it's better than last year, but we're still working on it as well. So. Fairfield down to ESP, um, and just to echo, we've had quite a few move-ins this year that are really changing the dynamics and the class sizes. Um, so that you should be aware of that for a small school that has a really large domino effect. Um, so what we really have to think about are what are the highest priorities for our children, um, and how can we serve them best. So it's all hands on deck every day. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So and and that was my question was just knowing the deficits that you have, are those still, are those key results, those outcomes still attainable? Like, are they still realistic and are they still attainable? That's, that was just my question. Certainly no, no judgment, just right. asking, just to make sure people aren't feeling. They're, they're good goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I think too, having um, a curriculum that we're all following and, and having an aligned <laughs> Um, all of these aligned check-in data and yeah. really looking at the data and then practicing uh, data teams is really going to be helpful. Um, so I think having that set forth and having a vision for the staff is going to be key for us this year. Yeah. So overall, 
district-wise, we're better going into the beginning of this school year than we were last year. Yes, no? I, I feel that we are. Yeah. <coughs> the staff is yep. I agree. We have a lot of veteran staff coming back. Um, and city school. Are we? <laughs> I'm new, so well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's great. If you're going to rock and roll, I don't know. <laughs> Or, um, I mean, 22 teachers is a lot of yeah. staff on top of we'll have the VSTs. Yeah. I, I echo my colleagues in that we are, um, we got to sample at camp some young children moving in with significant needs. That does change the scope of, of some support, but um, we do whatever it takes to, to get mission ready, and that's, that's what we do. It just means some of us will be working real hard. And how do we compare it to the rest of Hampton Town in terms of the rest of Vermont? No, yeah, the rest I, of the I, United I States. Last night it was on School Spring. Just kind of curious of what's going on. It was actually I was talking to my wife about her school and the issues she was dealing with, and um, so I actually started surfing around. And you know they have a new way of showing it. You could kind of look at it through their graphical data display and. Uh, I said several times, I'm glad I'm in the district I'm in mm -hmm. compared to what some others are dealing with. And uh, just missing licensed teachers right now, special educators, math, SLPs. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking for a school psychologist. We haven't been able to replace that. It just, there's a lot of high needs, and this staffing crisis will not go away. It's not a one-year fix. It's not a five-year fix. It's a big crisis for education, and it's not just Vermont. I mean, I see it. It's across the board, and the place where it's more acute is administrators. And I just, it's, it seemed, I, I read something the other day in Ed Week about a superintendent search where they were used to getting 15 to 20 qualified applicants, and they got one, and they, they didn't, come to agreement and so they're now with an interim. And that same story is written in Vermont in three places I know about right now. And the same is true for principals. It's true for directors. It's mm -hmm. true, for, you know, it, and those high, um, the places where we've always had challenging hirings up for all positions in the teacher ranks as well. We are, we are soon, I will not be surprised if we're soon thinking of how do we redesign our school systems. And, you know, as you and I saw at the superintendent board, we've got some other things coming that we're going to talk about. You asked to talk about with the economics, which mm -hmm. is just education and economics. It's a way of blending the two, but what is seen on the horizon. So. Well, sorry, I'm a little done, Yeah, sorry, but it, I, I'm also I'm still really excited. I said I've said it everywhere. I was saying it yesterday at Rotary. It's I'm really excited for this year. It's going to be a great year. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Right. Anyone have questions for Bill? So board announcements. <laughs> My daughter is leaving for school next week, and this is her last summer home, so it's been sad. Congratulations. Oh, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have. <laughs> We're real likely to Yeah. <laughs> all right, since no one else has any. You think, Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mark. Thank you very much for hosting and setting us all up. Did you bring the candy? Nice. <laughs> Go home and get a sugar high. I'm going to be back here next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, since um, there's no need for an executive session, the meeting is adjourned at 7.20 p.m. Thank you.